You know about the Pegasus bar on Capitol Hill, right? Uh, oh, you un- no, it's called Unicorn. Sorry, Unicorn, Unicorn. I think I've heard about it. It's been a while since I heard about it, but I believe. I don't know if it's bar. still open. They did have a drink called Unicorn Jizz. Yeah, and it was glittery. Yeah, glittery, I, glittery and pearlescent. I don't think it was, which is very oh. disappointing. That is disappointing. I've never been to this bar, but I fantasize about it because it's a gay-friendly carnival-themed bar. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to have a carnival theme bar if it's not gay friendly, are you? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I mean, you could, but you're going to be sadly disappointed by your clientele. <laughs> For real. I mean, it could probably be a bar that carnies would want to come to, but they don't pay a lot, I don't think. No. Well, I mean, they're not afraid to spend money. They're just afraid to bathe, in my experience. Carnies aren't buying $20 drinks. This is fair. <laughs> Unless they're gigantic. <laughs> How many gay super fab carnies do you think there are? <laughs> three. There's three. three. <laughs> Total. Worldwide. <laughs> and are they in the same circus or are they spread out? <laughs> they're spread out, pretending they're not fabulous. <laughs> and Spirits Podcast. Whoop, whoop. It's like a drink with death. Oh, was I supposed to say that part? Bad. <laughs> just rolling with it. <laughs> I'm Nick McDonald. I'm Kate McDonald. I was thinking, should we do like every other podcast does where they like have a, hey, how are you doing moment, you know, and, and we pretend we haven't already been talking for 80 minutes. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what my dog is mean mugging me. Hey, get your tongue out of the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what he was mean mugging you for. <laughs> that was obvious. <laughs> Do we need to just list Theo as a host of this podcast? Because he's here for every recording. Maybe. Can we uh, put a lapel mic on him so we just hear heavy breathing and slurping? All I mean, probably don't need to. I, I, I spent plenty of time editing out my heavy breathing and your slurping. <laughs> <laughs> I just really like snacks. I don't know why I'm offended by that. <laughs> and I'm just really out of shape. <laughs> Talking's hard. The gym's reopened here. They can have six people in them at a time, I guess. Oh, like Seattle was doing like 50 or something like that. Well, some of the other counties, I think, get to do that and indoor <laughs> dining again, but not this one because we don't believe in science. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. So, on, on this episode, we decided that we were going to cover the Warrens. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Not just, like, the Warrens down the street? Not like the Rabbit Warrens, no. <laughs> Goblin Warren from Magic the Gathering. Okay, I'm glad you know what you were talking about, because I was lost for that. <laughs> That's why I dropped the, the MTG, just to make it a little more clear. No, Ed and Lorraine Warren, famous demonologists and psychics, and uh, I guess now they're movie heroes. I guess they're movie heroes. Well, they have—I mean, they have a Warren verse, you know, like a Marvel universe. They have a a Warren universe. Weird. Yeah. They both died. <laughs> um, yes. Well, I mean, Lorraine died a, like what in twenty seventeen? I think she was like ninety two though, so it was it's fair. Like Seventeen or nineteen or yeah. Something. Yeah, it was fairly recent. But she was like 92, so it's fair. Yeah. I'm drinking glitter bubbles. <laughs> it's going to make me glittery and bubbly, right? Sure. So bubbly. I was drinking Coronas. I found out if the beer bottle has a little wedge of lime in the bottom, then the children won't try to use it to drink water out of later. And if it has Corona in it, then Kel won't try to drink it at all. So. <laughs> I just thought maybe this was how you were trying to give yourself a vaccine, because science. Your wife won't drink Corona? No. No, she'll she'll turn her, her nose up at my Coronas and then go... Drink Mike's some... hard lemonade? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Not even. She's not that fancy? No, we're talking like... Uh, well, I don't even know what the brand is. It's like, it's like Natty Best level, but not his name brand. Is it beer? I feel like she was drinking fruity things the last time I saw her drinking things. If she's presented with fruity things, she will. Oh, okay. If she's buying her own alcohol, 
all. She goes for efficiency and frugality. I believe I saw strawberry lemonade flavored Natty Ice service equivalent at the store the other day. So that was terrifying. That's horrifying. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Have some Huckleberry Steel Reserve to love it. <laughs> I mean, I would drink that at least <laughs> once. <laughs> well, once. You, you got to drink it once. I mean, like, Huckleberry is such an Oregon thing, and then Steel Reserve just brings back so much nostalgia. It does. <laughs> of when I possibly had you buy me alcohol when I was underage, and you wouldn't buy me more until I drank the 40 of Steel Reserve. You know, we had to set ground rules on buying alcohol, and Steel Reserve was how you made sure that that code was followed through. One time when Zane and Lee and I were all living together, Lee came around to mine and Zane's bedrooms like begging for money so he could go on a beer run. He said, I'll give you some money, I'll go on a beer run. So we gave him money and he came back with like 140 of Big Bear for himself and nothing for anyone else. <laughs> a couple of days later, we were going to the fair, so we figured we better load up our backpack with beer before we get to the fair. So we, I remember that fair year. So we went into the store and Lee said, hey, make sure to get me something. But since he was already in beer debt to us because of fucking us over the other night, we just brought him back steel reserve and said, there you go, asshole. There's your beer. <laughs> I mean, I do think Lee is responsible for the first time I ever got drunk. Seems likely. Not the first time I drank, but the first time I ever got drunk. There was redheaded sluts in backyard wrestling. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. We were drinking redheaded sluts. <laughs> to be fair, I probably had dyed red hair then as well. <laughs> not the redheaded slut in question here, though. I was not a slut yet then. I was an innocent child. Innocent child full of alcohol, wrestling on a trampoline in the backyard, and sprinting three blocks to catch the ice cream man. <laughs> Barefoot. Barefoot. <laughs> you know what? I got my ice cream. <laughs> Turn off your judgment. <laughs> <sighs> We're tangenting again. Tangenting, tangenting, change. Well, I've been trying to go out of my way to kind of cut out a lot of our tangents because I kind of felt like the 25 to 35 minute podcast was right in our sweet spot. But then we got more comfortable with podcasting, so our stories started getting longer and I had to start cutting out more of our tangents to make it fit. And at the end of the day, the only person who gives us any feedback on our podcast is Mel, and Mel wants the podcast to be longer, and she wants more tangents. So, congratulations Shh. to Mel. If anyone has a problem with it, voice it up. <laughs> I mean, I've had a few, I've had a, you know, small amount of feedback, and people like it. They're my friends that miss me and are possibly alcoholics, but a win's a win in my book. <laughs> The Warrens. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> the Warrens. So, I don't know how deep you got into the history of the Warrens. Should we talk about the history of the Warrens? Do you assume everyone knows the, who the Warrens are? No, I don't assume everyone knows who the Warrens are. I mean, I would like to hope everyone knows of the Warrens, but that's not fair to assume. <laughs> Do you want to... You going? I'm going. Who's going? Uh, I don't know. How, how deep did you go? I didn't go particularly deep. I got some uh, base level information. Well, I didn't go super deep, but they both started their love of the paranormal as children. So I guess that's like starting at the beginning. Is that true? Because from what I saw from what I read was uh, Lorraine was a skeptic until well after they were married and kind of Ed had to tow her along into it. Well, my research showed that like Lorraine had some psychic abilities as a child, but she just kind of assumed everyone had them. Like she would see auras and things of that nature. Huh. See, the this version I read was that she was a skeptic and it wasn't until well well we'll continue up because mine doesn't kick in until well after they're married. So we'll just go through the timeline until we get to that point. <laughs> Alright. Well mine timeline shows Ed and Lorraine both around eight, nine, ten becoming aware of the paranormal. So Ed lives in a haunted house. His father tells him there's a logical explanation for the things that are happening, but never actually offers him a logical explanation. Just tells him there is one. And then Lorraine's going to Catholic school. And I know there's a special on Discovery right now that uh, is about the, the Warrens. I think it's called Devil's Road. 
something like that. That talks about Lorraine at Catholic school, but I don't think that's where I read that Lorraine saw auras around the nuns and ended up getting in trouble for it, but she thought everyone saw them, so she was really confused. Yeah. Okay. So Ed and Lorraine meet at Ed's work at a movie theater where he, I think, is like an usher. They were both 16 at the time. He worked there, and she was brought in by her mother every Wednesday night. And they fall in love. Ed joins the military. The Navy. They're dating. Ed, do you get deployed in the Navy? He did get deployed, but uh, the ship he was on got sank after four months. And he knew... He got sent home for survivor's leave. (laughs) He got 30 days of survivor's leave, nearly died, (laughs) and decided to marry Lorraine in that time. (laughs) <laughs> I just didn't know if deployed was the word they use for Navy stuff. <sighs> Ahoyed instead of deployed? I don't know. Boated. We're upsetting so many people right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> My, the military guru is at work. I don't have answers. <laughs> anyway, I, I got nothing else of consequence through World War II. Afterwards, Ed returned and uh, went to Perry Art School, uh, subsidiary of Yale, for two years. Before he got fed up with that, I think they had Judy in the interim. I feel I they did. He was deployed. Yeah. He was deployed in Japan for World War Two, I think, or right after World War Two when their daughter was born. Their daughter Judy. I've noticed that, like, from my Google searches, it seems like a lot of people are really obsessed with Judy, and I, I don't understand why. I didn't, I didn't get it. Maybe Judy's a fox. I don't know what Judy looks like right now. She looks like she's seventy and married, is what she looks like. Um, and then Ed's. Uses, well, Ed and Lorraine didn't plan on being paranormal investigators. They both planned on being artists. These very religious Roman Catholic beatniks just going to be artists. Hey, you know what? In the 60s, like, Roman Catholic religious beatnik was a thing. That was the era that brought us Godspell, okay? Okay. That was a thing. (laughs) But anyway, Ed uses this fine arts background to start drawing houses. He just has an inkling or haunted. And then he sends Lorraine up to the house with the drawings to give them to the owners, and she starts chit chatting. And well, it wasn't it wasn't just if he had an inkling. He he was still interested in the paranormal, and if he heard claims about a haunted house or a haunted location, like that was his foot in the door to check it out. Was he'd stand in the street and sketch it, and have Lorraine go up and say, "Oh, my husband just loved your house, and he wanted to dress to draw it," and, and that would get them inside so they could just talk to him and say, "So, how's the house?" Type stuff. I like it. I could do that. Except I'm not that good <laughs> at art, so. I know Ed bragged at the time that he was, I mean, even aside from the uh, getting into houses, like he would make three to four bucks a painting, which at the time was a sizable amount of money because we're talking like dime for a hamburger days. (laughs) Fair. But then, yeah, that's how their investigating started. And then people started calling them eventually when they had weird things happening. Well, yeah, um, Ed was at the time... Um, there was only seven demonologists in the United States, and Ed was the only layman. The other six were all priests. How do you get classified as a demonologist? How do you get that on your business card? <sighs> I don't know. It's kind of, maybe it's like being a podcaster. Like, once you do it enough that other people call you that, um, you're in there. If I put influencer in my Instagram profile, nope. Yes. <laughs> Nailed it! And a model influencer with 30 followers and i'm an entrepreneur entrepreneurs entrepreneur one of my friends sent me i don't remember i sent her a picture and she respond of killian she responded that he was going to be an entrepreneur and i was like a real one or like i say i'm an entrepreneur on tender <laughs> we decided real one okay anyway um The story that I got for Lorraine was that she was skeptic for quite some time until they started doing their, uh, their, it's just the weirdest story I found. Because I found a story from Ed describing how that came about. Uh, But the long and short of it was that, like, she was a skeptic and she didn't know she was psychic. And then one day they tried to do the same thing where they draw a picture and get into the house and, and talk to the people. And then the story says, and the 
Long story short, that's the first time that we knew she was psychic, because she astrally projected over the top of us all. <laughs> I'm going, you just yada yada the whole psychic awakening of that story. What huh. the hell's going on here? Okay. <laughs> that's the, that was the one thing I was looking for, because when I... Because I found, oh, she was a skeptic until this, and I'm like, okay, well, let's uh, let's let's hear about that transition. And I couldn't find any transition. The closest I got was a fucking yada yada story. That's <laughs> kind of awesome, and also really shitty for our point of view. But <laughs> just yada yada sex. What? Yeah, exactly. The yada yada psychic awakening. <laughs> they even mentioned the salad. Well, and I. So, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a tangent? I'm well. It was a related tangent. I still, <laughs> I still have my skepticisms on Ed. Um, something about Ed really rubs me wrong. I know there, he's potentially people thought he they were both frauds, but Lorraine did go to be evaluated at UCLA at one point in time by their parapsychology department, and they decided yeah. that she was a light trans medium, kind of justified everything. But Ed gives me the creeps a little bit. I did read that Ed was probably having an affair there. And well, that someone affair came up was... in 2017 and said that they had an affair with him and that he made them abort the baby. Yeah, and that she was 15 at the time that they started yeah. their affair. So that kind of justifies the vibes I get from Ed. And I don't know. I mean... I mean, I don't know Ed. It's just that's how... Yeah, and, and it's one of those situations where... I, I don't know whether or not those claims were true. Yeah. I mean, this this was after Money for the Conjuring started rolling in, so, you know, kind of convenient timing. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's... And everything I've read about the Warrens, they didn't make money when they went to help people at their homes. If they were scared for their lives, scared for their well-being, they weren't charging anything of these people. They were collecting money from, like, universities and things of that nature for speaking engagements. And book sales. And book sales and that sort of stuff. But if you called them and said, I'm worried about my well-being, I'm worried about my child, they would show up. They weren't trying to get money out of that. No, and which is That's good. very respectable. Yeah, there was a whole thing about Ed possibly having an underage affair that doesn't sit well. The, the thing that didn't sit well with me for Ed also is that... He had that policy, I felt, of if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything's a nail. Because it seems like... Everything's a demon? Everything's a demon. Ah, it's a demon. It's a demon. Ah, your car's making a funny noise. Ah, it's a demon. Refrigerator's not working. That's a demon. You got the gas? Ah, that's a demon. That also bothered me. Like, Lorraine would be like, (laughs) there's 15 ghosts and a demon. But there was still a demon at, like, every investigation. And I just don't think they're that rampant. From my personal studies and experiences? I wouldn't think so. I think that's a little much, yeah. Unless the demons were just following Lorraine everywhere, waiting for an opportunity to pounce, which I guess is plausible. (laughs) But you'd think she would, if she's that good of a psychic, would know that that's what's happening. I don't know. Maybe. But, I mean, she also, I mean, she also kind of ignored that aspect of her psychic ability until, you know, she started following Ed's charge on it. So if Ed's, if Ed's saying, oh no, that's a demon. Oh, that's a demon there too. You're seeing a demon. That was a demon over there you saw. Like, you know, what is she to think? So they didn't have the internet. They didn't have ghost hunters on the cable. They just kind of had to figure it out for themselves. Well, I, <laughs> I do have, you know, like friends from that are more sensitive to things going on around them than other people that are from very religious backgrounds that were raised that if something is happening, like anything paranormal, it is a demon. There aren't friendly ghosts. There are demons and there are nothing. Like, so... Wow, yeah. Well, and, you know, we're talking... I mean, I don't want to get too metaphysical here because that's not exactly what this podcast is. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of times your own belief and understanding of the world is going to paint what it is that you're seeing in these situations because they're we're, we're dealing with a lot of abstracts and 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 non-solid concepts here so that's definitely going to be a factor when you're trying to interpret what's going on well and, and i mean i think that's a very fair point of view like that's part of the reason i think people that were brought up not being told seeing ghosts is weird are more up to see ghosts like yeah i wasn't projecting there at all <laughs> There is proof, too, to that concept. Um, 
I was uh, just talking with Kel about how for a long time, and, and I originally heard this story about the Japanese, but I saw a book recently that kind of implied that it was lots of cultures didn't really see the color green for a long time. Interesting. Like like your go light on your stoplight would be blue because you didn't have the nomenclature to separate blue as a color. Like that was just another shade of green. So to your mind, the way your mind interpreted things, that's green. Which is fair, but colors are also like, I've even seen some things like on Instagram and Facebook where it's like, how many shades of red do you see? And, like, some people are like, there's three. And I'm like, there's 14. Yeah, but also a lot of those are... Because I've seen that, too, and it's like, oh, here's the difference between men and women. And it's and I saw someone argue, no, it's that men have... Well, <laughs> men <laughs> only have three names for red colors, while women have 14 different colors, names for red. <laughs> but, that, that, I mean, that falls back in that same category. Yeah. And, uh, you know, men are norm- more naturally prone to color blindness because the gene for cones in your eyes is uh, on the X chromosome. So if you only, so if your X chromosome is missing that, then your Y one's not going to back it up. So that's going to lend towards color blindness. Well, yeah, women are carriers of color blindness, but. It's rare in them. <laughs> as this was years ago, I was reading about a scientist who had a theory that there was women who actually had an extra cone. And um, he didn't give any details, but he said he had managed to track one down. So that means that, or maybe he tracked a couple. But anyway, these women would see colors to another degree than what we see. Like if we, if, if a normal three-coned viewer can see 25 million colors, these women would be able to see 125 million colors or something like that. Yeah, which makes sense. Uh, I don't know. We tangent it enough. Um, the Warrens established the New England Society for Psychic Research in 1952. Which became an occult museum, right? It didn't start that way, but they started kind of collecting things. Well, yeah, they started collecting, you know... Like the Annabelle doll. Cursed, cursed items, the Annabelle doll, and, and other things that were chock full of, of bad juju. I go to the Annabelle doll just because it's one of the more well-known items, not because I think it's more important than any of the other things in their museum. No. Well, that kind of bridges us on to where we were headed anyway, the Conjuring movies, which have recently come out and are kind of based on the case files of some of the Warren's more outlandish cases. Their big one was the Amityville case. That's the one that really kind of grabbed national attention and put them in on a big spotlight. Yeah. There's a, been a bunch of things that were based loosely on their investigations, like a haunting in Connecticut. Just like they're mm-hmm. they're pretty popular in pop culture at this point in time. Popular, popular in pop culture. Pop, 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 pop music. I'm not giving you the both popcorn. You just need to simmer down. <laughs> he heard pop. <laughs> this dog, I tell you. Um, and then there is another Conjuring movie coming out. Uh, yeah, the uh, the devil made me do it, which is the Arnie uh, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson case. Uh, I wasn't sure about the details. I just know that it's the one where they basically got a court to admit there was ghosts, which is you know kind of fantastic, right there. Just just even just that little tidbit is amazing. <laughs> From what I understand, that was Ed's favorite thing to tell people. It's like I can't get scientists to agree with me, but I got it proved in a court of law. I thought those <laughs> were different cases, but I'm not going to pretend I researched that exclusively. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't look into that. But I know that the case was based on Arnie Cheyenne Johnson killing his landlord and then saying a demon made him do it because his, I think, like niece or nephew had been they thought possessed. They did an exorcism and then it came into him and then he murdered his landlord. So, do you want to? I, I know you looked hard at. Was it the Hunting in Connecticut case? Was that the... No, I looked... Or is that a different case? That's a different case. Hunting in Connecticut is based on the Snedeker House case, which was a funeral home. It had been a funeral home that became a private residence that was supposed to be infested with demons. Okay. Because demons. I kind of stuck my research. I glanced at things, but I dug a little deeper into the Perron family or the Perone family, which they were in Rhode Island. They're the family that the um, first Conjuring movie is based on. Uh So that was a husband and wife with five children bought this farmhouse in rural Rhode Island. 
I believe it was 200 acres. It was a 14 room farmhouse and they are in the farmhouse and they start experiencing things. They didn't really know what to do. They'd put all their money into this house. So they were kind of frantic about what to do. So January 1971, the Perrin family bought a 14 room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. Roger, Carolyn, their five daughters, they uh, start noticing strange things happening immediately. The broom would go missing and show up all over the place. They'd clean the house and then find piles of dirt in the middle of the kitchen. They would hear talking. So they have they have children. Right? That's I what have, it sounds like to me. Exactly. <laughs> My kid's obsessed with the broom. I don't ever know what it, where it is. I think it's literally like on the floor in the middle of the kitchen right now. Golden snitches don't catch themselves. But it said the girls started noticing spirits around the house. Nothing seemed quite malevolent at first. And then suddenly things started getting weirder. Carolyn found, like, she took a nap on the couch and woke up with a puncture wound in her leg and a puddle of blood underneath it that she couldn't find an answer, like, how that happens. They would hear noises. They'd hear scraping noises, doors slamming, that sort of stuff. So the... They brought in the Warrens for that. If you've seen The Conjuring, which if you're listening to us, you probably have. It kind of focuses on the spirit of a witch named Bathsheba. And Bathsheba was a real character in this unfolding of the haunting. But she wasn't as evil as they proclaim she is in the show. But, you know, we're making a Hollywood movie here. So that's to be expected. The farmhouse according to Carolyn's research, was owned by the same family for eight generations. Many of them died under mysterious or horrible circumstances. Children drowned in the nearby creek. One was murdered. Some people hung themselves. And not just one person. Some people hung themselves in the attic. (laughs) Bathsheba was there in the mid-1800s. Legends, like local legends, say that she was rumored to be a Satanist. She had, according to these local legends, four children that didn't live to be past the age of seven. There's evidence that she had been involved in the death of a neighbor's child, though no trial ever took place. But there's there was no proof that Bathsheba had more than one child. There's one that they can find census records for. And, like, in the movie, she was hung for her foul acts, but she really lived to be into her 80s and, like, died of natural causes. <laughs> Lorraine believed that Bathsheba is the one that punctured Caroline and was causing the malicious stuff, like the rotting smell that would be in the house randomly. Mm-hmm. The basement was somewhere no one wanted to be So the family stayed in the house for 10 years until they were able to afford to move. The Warrens made multiple trips there to investigate. At one point in time, Lorraine conducted a seance in the home to contact the spirits that were possessing the family. During the seance, Carolyn, the mother, becomes possessed, starts speaking in tongues, and rises from the ground in her chair. The children were not invited to the seance, but Andrea, the oldest daughter, who also released a book about the happenings in that house, claims to have witnessed the seance without her parents knowing. Cheeky book. After the seance, though, Roger kicked the Warrens out. (laughs) He was worried that they were having a bad effect on Carolyn's mental stability. Stop possessing yourself. Stop possessing yourself. Stop possessing yourself. So according to the oldest daughter, Andrea, around 1980, they move out when they can finally afford to and everything stops. All of the paranormal activity in their lives stops. Other, I've, I looked into it and some of the other owners of the house have had things happen there. Like the current owners hear talking in other rooms. They have doors open and close, but nothing they would say is malicious. Mm -hmm. Fun facts. I went and saw The Conjuring in the theater when it came out, and then drove 45 minutes to the middle of nowhere to the apparently haunted farmhouse mom and dad owned at that point in time, so that was fun. (laughs) No one was home, it was very dark. With a creepy attic room. Right next to my bedroom. (laughs) The house where I literally had arguments with the stairwell lights that would respond, so you know. (laughs) <laughs> Not my smartest move, but Tequila had been involved with the decision to go see the movie. See, I had no idea originally when the first one came out that these movies were based on the Warrens. So that was just kind of a shock when I finally got around to seeing it. It's like, oh, 
You're about the That's Warren, part of the cool. reason I went is because I had liked Lorraine Warren for years. Yeah. I became especially fond of her during the paranormal state days, so. Yeah. Well, and, and when we said we were going to do the Warrens, I saw that as my opportunity to do the infield poltergeist. Now, it wouldn't be an episode of the Booze and Spirits podcast if somebody didn't absolutely whiff picking a story that went with the theme. What, what? <laughs> because, well, and here's the thing. The infield poltergeist is in my top five favorite ghost stories. When I was a kid, that was one of the ones that really stood out to me that I, that I liked reading about. And it just kind of sat in the back of my mind for a long time. And then The Conjuring 2 came out. I said, okay, well, let's see the new Warrens movie. And it's like, oh, and like I recognized right away, this is the infield poltergeist. That's amazing. I, I didn't know the Warrens were involved with that. Dun, dun, dun. And the reason is because the Warrens really didn't have much of Jack to do with the infield poltergeist case in the long run. They made, so, they made an appearance, right? Yeah, I'll get to that. Let me go into the, the whole thing since the Warrens are just such a minor footnote. Uh, the infield haunting started in August uh, 1977. It was 284 Green Street, Brimsdown, infield London, the home of single mother Peggy Hodgson and her four children. So the first sign of something odd was that two of the kids, Janet and Johnny, complained that something kept shaking and moving their beds around at bedtime. Peggy told them, knock it off. It's foolishness. Go back to sleep. Next night, commotion came from the room again. So Peggy went to the kids' room, only to find the door obstructed by a chest of drawers. She pushed her way in, squeezed into the room, then shoved the drawers back against the wall, only to have some unseen force push them back towards the door while they were still in her grip. At this point, Peggy knew something truly bizarre was a play, so she huddled the family together and they went over to the neighbor's house to wait out the night. So this was the start of what would be an 18-month marathon of torment. (laughs) <laughs> Not just the paranormal activity, but also a never-ending queue of reporters, investigators, looky loo skeptics, believers, debunkers, and uh, just flat-out rigorous scrutiny that still echoes even to this day. By the time it was all said and done, over 30 individuals would claim witness to the incidents in Infield. The Hodgson family was beset by beds lifting, furniture moving, chairs being overturned. There would be knocking that would race up and down the halls or fade in and out so much that nobody felt comfortable sleeping without the lights on. Objects would launch themselves across the room. Eventually, whispers and voices would start making themselves known, and the children themselves would reportedly be picked up and tossed around the room, too. The first major outside witness to the activity was a police constable. She sat and watched as a chair wobbled and moved on its own accord. She inspected the chair and found no wires, no strings, or anything else that would explain the phenomenon. The police sympathized with the family, but they also uh, explained that because there was no real crime happening, they couldn't stay, so they had to leave and leave the poor family to their own devices. As Peggy continued searching for help, uh, eventually her case reached the ears of the Society for Psychical Research, and investigators Maurice Gross, although I've heard him say Morris, it's spelled Maurice, Morris Gross, maybe, and Guy Leon Playfair. They arrived to try to make sense of things. Over the coming months, the two men would see furniture move and spin, find small objects like marbles and Legos tossed around the room, and and they even commented that they would be hot to the touch after they picked them up. And eventually captured tape of phantom voices and photos of children reportedly levitating. Gross remarked, it's smarter than we are. Look at its timing. The moment you go out of a room, something happens. You stay in the room for hours and nothing moves. It knows what we're up to. Gross and Place Fair's investigation found the activity to be mostly focused on the two girls, Margaret, age 13, and Janet, age 11. And this is the part that cracks me up because we have a we have a Marge and Maggie Simpson situation where the mother is Peggy and the oldest daughter is Margaret. So they're both Margaret's. Sounds right. (laughs) And I found some interviews, and Janet even calls Margaret Peggy at some instances. So I don't know how these people do that. Why is it always Margaret that that happens to? Because there's so many nicknames for Margaret that it's easier to do. I guess. And Elizabeth. Yeah. But why would you name... And Lorelai, apparently, if you watch Gilmore Girls. I don't. (laughs) You might have guessed. (laughs) There's three Lorelai Gilmores. (laughs) Janet was deemed to be the epicenter of the haunting, though. Gross and Playfair noted right away curious whistles and talking coming from Janet's general direction. She would often be levitated about against her will or go into trances from which she couldn't recall any details, and sometimes talk in a deep, gruff voice of a man calling himself Bill. 
I knew the voices were happening, of course, Janet says in a 2011 interview. Felt like something was behind me all the time. They did all sorts of tests, filling my mouth with water and so on, but the voices still came out. The levitation was scary because you didn't know where you are going to land. I remember a curtain being wound around my neck. I was screaming. I thought I was going to die. Bill claimed to be the former resident of the home and that he had died while sitting in a chair in the living room, suffering a hemorrhage in his sleep. Janet said, I felt used by a force that nobody understands. I, I really didn't like to think about it too much. She did also admit to playing with a Ouija board shortly before the incidents began. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to this. I do have some multimedia presentation here, but we'll wait a little bit for that. A multimedia presentation? Yeah. I didn't prepare a PowerPoint for today. <laughs> As the activities and phenomena became more grand, so did the scrutiny, and holes in the claims started to emerge. First off, Bill would only talk if Janet and Margaret were together and in another room, separate from everyone else with the door closed. And Bill's conversations were peculiar in that he would often change the subject mid-conversation, a habit that Janet had as well. He also seemed oddly interested in things a girl would deal with in puberty, like menstruation. Some weird old men are into that. I don't know. Well, that's true. Now, the thing about this, and these are notes I made before I went and I tracked down my Voltime Media stuff. I actually did find video of her doing the voice, like, in front of other people. So I don't know how much, I mean, it, it started that way, but apparently she was able to generate the voice around other people eventually. So, this is an interview with Janet. What about the voices? When, when did the voices start? December the 12th. December the 12th? Yes. And how did this start? Well, one night Mr. Grove was talking about it about 8.30. He said, all we need now is the voices to talk. And that night I went to bed. And I can't remember exactly what happened. And what, what's that knocking? Yeah, that's can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning and Peggy was on her own. So she came in to us because you know, it wasn't her, she came in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down my knocks and there was fourteen altogether. And it's doing it again now. So that was Janet. Janet um, sounds like a little boy. Okay. <laughs> So this is, is Bill speaking through Janet. Now, I'll just play it and we can evaluate after. Right, that's good. Come on out. Shut up, there you go. I'm 32 years old. I come from doing right, great job. And I have right here the church. Where we live. And all my friends come from there as well. And we all make a day and go to the pub. And then we thought we'd pick your house because I used to live here. And I will tell you some more. And if you don't get anyone else, the second story and Mr. Blayback. I don't like that. <laughs> I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. Just before you died and just after you died. Days before I died, I did. Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> so that's the Bill voice. So they're very different, as you could hear. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about, uh, and I mentioned there about having a hemorrhage in his chair and dying, and then that was in the audio where he said that the son of the former resident who lived there confirmed those claims that Bill had, that he died in the chair. So there was, there was a Bill, a Bill Wilkinson, who lived in the house 
before the Hodgsons, and he he died in his chair from a brain hemorrhage. I feel like Janet wouldn't have been able to Google that at this point in time. Well, I guess not, but I mean, that, that still is public record. Someone there could have known. So a neighbor could have told them. Yeah. We had other loose threads start to unravel. They did find an article torn from a magazine in the house that was about Matthew Manning. And uh, Matthew Manning is another famous poltergeist case from about the same time. But a lot of the early incidents in his case kind of mirrored a lot of the early incidents in the Hodgson case. Um. The famous photographs of the girls levitating were pointed out as easily being well-timed photos of children jumping in their bed. So here's one of them. Yeah. So the claim is that they're levitating. No one Now, my understanding is no one was in the room with the girls when this happened. They had a camera that was set to automatically snap a picture every 15 seconds. Okay. Was what's going on here, and that's where these came from. They claim that they were levitating. I guess at one point, Ed Warren claimed that one of the girls levitated in her sleep, but they, but there never were any eyewitnesses. Um, oh, well, and, and sorry, I did have one more picture here. I'll just show it now, which is a picture of Janet, kind of like a good clear picture of her. And I, I just wanted to bring this up, how unfortunately the girl was, uh, her face was shaped at this age. She, she grew up to look much nor- more normal, but at this point, she has a rather large nose and kind of uh, kind of teeth that stick out. So she looks kind of like well, a, she she's British. Well, she looks like a bad cartoon of a of a British policeman is what she looks yeah. like. So I, I just bring that up because of the voice thing. So if you just listen to the voice, Bill doesn't sound like anything that could come from a, a little girl. But if you see the picture of her and that large nasal cavity you start to understand how it could be possible for a child playing around with vocal tricks to kind of get that weird raspy voice to come out of their body. I mean, I feel like I should get a video of Nat saying, I like them big. I like them Because <laughs> it's, it's fair. Yeah. Gross and play fair, though they never denied an actual haunting was at work, did see evidence of foul play at times. They had on occasion caught Janet banging on the walls or ceiling with a broomstick, ah, not a broomstick, or trying to hide Playfair's tape recorder. Playfair believed that though the haunting was real, that the girls became enamored of the attention and would create activity for their own benefit, sometimes clumsily, uh, especially on camera. In interviews, Janet would often wave ex- excitedly at the camera and then put her hands over her mouth in shock, in air quotes when mysterious voices or noises occurred. When BBC Scotland visited to do a story on the haunting, the girls were asked, how does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? To which Janet responded, it's not haunted, only to have Margaret shut her by whispering, shut up! (laughs) Your children can never fake a poltergeist. (laughs) Indeed, one video even caught Janet bending spoons and attempting to bend an iron bar when she thought she wasn't being watched. Experts from other disciplines observed the behavior and were left unimpressed. Ventriloquist Ray Allen said all the voices and whispers could easily be done with vocal tricks. Stage magicians Milborn Christopher and Joe Nickel visited the family as well. Nickel observed that objects only seemed to move or be thrown when no one was looking at them. The girls were blamed for wanting attention, especially from two doting male investigators showing up so recently after their father had left the family. So, uh, Gross had lost his own daughter, also named Janet, in a motorcycle accident. So, there could be a little bit of a surrogate father thing happening there. Damn it, Janet. Their mother, Peggy, was accused of trying to scam the housing council into finding her a better place to live. Do you blame her? (laughs) I mean, no. (laughs) Janet was bullied in school, called Ghost Girl. One of the brothers was called Freak from the Ghost House and spat at in the street. Many psychiatrists and health professionals thought the whole incident would just end if Gross and Playfair would leave the family alone. Uh, eventually, Mrs. Hodgson got to the point that, with the exception of Gross and Playfair, she refused to welcome others into the house. Mm. Despite the uh, rather deep cuts that Occam razors seemed to be leaving everywhere, Gross and Playfair continued to be convinced of the haunting's genuineness. They had seen too many things they considered to be unexplainable to throw the whole case away on a couple of childish pranks. At one point, Janet and Margaret even admitted to faking the whole thing, but were convinced by Gross and Playfair to recant their confession. Playfair said, 
it almost seemed as though the poltergeists were out to incriminate her, meaning Janet, by proliferating third-rate phenomena in the presence of first-rate observers. According to Janet, a priest visited in 1978. The activity calmed down after that, but never totally subsided. Janet left home at age 16 and married young. Janet's brother Johnny tragically died at the age of 14 from cancer shortly after the presentation drifted away. What the fuck? Like, I know that's unrelated, but it's aggressive. (laughs) Bobby, the youngest, felt watched until the day he moved out. Well, and also, another unrelated thing for this poor woman is Janet's own son passed away in his sleep at the age of 18. Their mother, Peggy, passed away in 2003 from breast cancer and still lived in the home at the time. Well, I mean... I, I don't feel like she was a young lass at, in 2003, at least. No, probably not, no. Janet said the presence in the home never fully went away. Quote, years later, when Mum was alive, there was always a presence there, something watching over you. As long as people don't meddle with it the way we did with Ouija boards, it's quite settled. It's a lot calmer than when I was a child. It is at rest, but it will always be there. End quote. Don't open portals, unless you know what you're doing <laughs> with a portal. Let's see you know how to close a portal. Never open a portal if you don't know how to close a portal. That should be the first rule. After Peggy's death, a new family moved in, a mother with four boys. They reported constantly feeling watched and regularly hearing whispers and talking from downstairs at night. The night before they moved out, the 15-year-old was woken in the night to see a shadowy man enter his room. He ran to his mother's room and told her, we've got to move. <laughs> Janet did admit that the girls tried to fake some of the phenomenon, but says that every time they tried, Gross or Playfair would catch them. When asked how much of the phenomenon they were responsible for, she said about 2%. I didn't want to bring it up again while my mom was alive, Janet says, but now I want to tell my story. I don't care whether people believe me or not. I went through this, and it was true. So the, the I think why this case always stuck out with me in my mind was that it was kind of the first one that I read, because I read a lot of ghost stories when I was three, four, or five. This was the first one that I read that I remember a lot of reasonable doubt being cast on. Because <laughs> most of those books were, oh, look at this spooky stuff. But this one actually said, yeah, there's a lot of shadiness happening in here. That's fair. <laughs> and you may have noticed I didn't mention the Warrens very much there because the Warrens showed up one night, uh, completely uninvited, <laughs> by, according to Gross and Playfair. And according to Playfair, before he left, Ed kind of, Gave him a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and said, boy, you can make a lot of money off this case. <laughs> oh, and of course, they declared demons. Demons! Demons. Demons. It was demons. <laughs> so, that's the, uh, uh, I don't know, I assume most people have seen The Conjuring too by now. You know, a lot of the things that happen in that movie are kind of factual and pertinent to the case, except for the whole thing about the Warrens being there and saving the day within three days. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, they do a, do a lot of those bits where they use some of that dialogue that Bill used, and they have her put water in her mouth, and they they made, they have a, a reference to the curtain get wrapped around her throat, a few other things, her being caught bending things on purpose. But of course, because of the movie, they had to say, oh no, well, the reason they caught her was because the spirits told her she had to do that, or else they would kill the family and because it was a movie about the warrens it wasn't just a ghost of a bill the ghost the ghost of bill was being used by a demon demons <laughs> demons demons i'm not saying it was demons <laughs> demons but it was demons god we gotta find a picture of ed warren doing the aliens pose so <laughs> can... <laughs> i have a few pictures of my child with that hairdo after a nap but not quite the same well, did you come up with a uh, drink for a good Catholic demonologist? I uh, I have not tried it, but I have a plan of attack here because I had some other drinks I had to make for some other things we have going on. <laughs> and me having essentially the amount of alcohol in three martinis during one recording just seems a little excessive. But like I said, I like Lorraine, and I think she's a classy broad, so I'm going to make a kind of a cognac sour-esque beverage. I found this uh, simple syrup I'm really excited to use, so I was going to make an Earl Grey simple syrup from Earl Grey tea, 
but I was running some errands yesterday and decided I don't have enough house plants. So I popped into this little local <laughs> shop I've been uh, wanting to go into, but they're typically closed on my weekend. Well, they are closed on my weekend, but I had an extra day off. So I popped in yesterday and found this uh, simple syrup that is bergamot, pink peppercorn, another flavor obsession of mine, and rose geranium. So, this may be awful. <laughs> and if it is, you'll just find some random recipe for, like, a margarita on the website. But I'm going to use some cognac and the simple syrup, maybe some citrus and an egg white, shake it up, and I think it's going to be pretty delicious. All right. If it's not, you'll know by the time this airs and the recipe on the website has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. <laughs> it's just vodka you're, and you're, tonic water. You're exposing the wires and springs. They can see the wires and springs. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Do we have a name for this? Do you have a, pr- a proposed name that, that will force us to be stuck with making this drink work, whether you can or not? The Lorraine Warren? I don't know. The Boozy Buffon? Ooh. I don't feel like it's a Buffonti drink, though. Judy Special Garden, that sounds dirty. That does sound dirty. That's where our drink names usually end up. It's true. I mean, my thought was essentially just like the Lorraine, but... I could be the Lorraine from Back to the Future. We don't know. That could be our grandma. It could be our grandma Lorraine, who also saw dead people. Um, The syrup is from June Taylor Jams. Does that help? Um... It could be... Could be the haunting in Connecticut. I don't know. Haunting in Bergamot. The cognac in Connecticut. <laughs> Annabelle absinthe. There's no absinthe in it. I know. And we can't make a better absinthe drink than Skylar's Revenge. Except the last time I drank a Skylar's Revenge, I threw up a lot. You're doing that thing where you think that the rest of the people know everything that you know again. <sighs> I. It was a drink we made that maybe someday I'll <laughs> tell you about because Skylar really wants to be on the podcast. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's fair. That can wait then. The Smurl House? I don't know. The Smurl House? It's one of their investigations. Cognac Werewolf? The Cognac made me do it. Cognac West? <laughs> Cardinal Ratzinger? Catholicism and Chill? <laughs> the Conjuring of Cognac? Maybe. I was trying to think of a drink that it has nothing to do with, and we could call it the infield, whatever that is, since the Warrens weren't at all involved with the infield poltergeist. The infield margarita? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> There's demons in the cognac? <laughs> the spirit of the devil? I don't know. Uh, Ed's a cheater? <laughs> I'm not saying it was cognac, but cognac. <laughs> I'm not mad at that. <laughs> it's a little wordy. <laughs> Well, the Smurl was the succubus case. Oh. Some 15-year-old succubus that uh, was a demon? Demons. He had to abort her demon, maybe? It's probably a demon sour. We just call it Ed's secret shame. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. Ed's secret shame. Ed's secret <laughs> shame. <laughs> a nice flowery cognac drink. A fluffy, fat, flowery cognac drink. I was trying to use this drink to I know. to represent Lorraine's strength and grace, and here we are with Ed's secret shame. <laughs> Perfectly normal Earth children. <laughs> All right, next episode. Let's talk about the next episode. Is that we gotta do more episodes? Is that the St. Patty's Day episode? It is the St. Patty's Day episode because of our horrible pairing of holidays with our release schedule. Which I know you want to do a St. Patty's Day episode, but you haven't actually told me what that means, so I'm just going to get real real whiskey drunk. And well, I don't know. I assume we got to do something Irish, right? Throw up. Or do you want to do Fae Folk? Or should we just see what we each come up with? And we don't do Fae Folk. We don't do Fae Folk in this house. Like, there's no Tooth Fairy coming into this house. <laughs> well, I was thinking like leprechauns, but... Something St. Patty's Day themed. Okay. And I have to throw my baby a brooms and kittens birthday party because he's a witchling, apparently. All right. It's better than being a changeling, right? Uh, his birthday was supposed to be St. Patrick's Day or Friday the 13th. He managed to not show up for He either. managed to dodge every holiday in that span of time. Well, so now his birthday is Stone Cold Day. Oh, yeah. 
forgot about that one. Because I know he missed Pi Day, and he missed the Ides of March. <laughs> his due date was Friday the 13th, and his me getting induced, he should have been born on St. Patrick's Day, but he took the emergency exit for Stone Cold Day. Yeah, and I can't fault someone for that. He does, Give the option. He does like to get suplexed, so... <laughs> So, St. Patty's and Suplex are other good Irish activities on the next episode. Oh, and you know what? Everything that I planned on putting in a prize package has arrived. Oh, are you going to so in the have that ready by the time the podcast comes out, or is that going to be a next episode thing? I don't know. What do you think? I, should... I don't care. I can make it happen. All right, well, it's a... So it's not a St. Patrick's Day themed gift assortment. Well, so I know that. I could put something green in it. Booger wiped on the bottom. <laughs> Just one booger. <laughs> Do you know what what kind of hoops you're making people jump through for this prize? I haven't decided yet. Okay, so we'll just... That'll be in the social media. Then that won't be in the episode here. <laughs> True story. So keep your eyes open for the social media, because it's possible by the time you hear this, we've posted that contest. I got shit you can win. We got Patreon you can join. You can like us and leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. Only some of these things have boogers wiped on them. <laughs> it's up to you to find out where the boogers are. <laughs> Check out our show notes. I will have uh, some of my multimedia presentation on there. He's got his PowerPoint ready to load. I'm really bad at putting stuff from the episode into the show notes when I really should. Like some references to the Warrens or the infield page. Theo licking the microphone. Uh, the show notes, you know, you can catch those on our website, boozeandspirits.com. I know that a lot of the links that in the show notes end up also in Spotify. I don't know if they translate to Apple Podcasts or any of the other services. As well. I think they should um, to Apple. I don't know about the other providers. Yeah. Um, and I do include the links with YouTube, but YouTube is not like hot links in their episode description. So it's just like highlight, click, go to this site. So uh, where are we on socials now? Facebook.com slash booze and spirits. It's, right? Yep. Instagram, booze and spirits pod. Now, Booze and Spirits Podcast on Instagram. Oh. Twitter is Booze and Spirits Pod. Or is it Booze Spirits Pod on Twitter? Oh, you're right. It is Booze Spirits We're not Pod. very God. good at this. We suck. <laughs> Facebook.com slash Booze and Spirits. Twitter.com slash Booze Spirits Pod. Instagram.com slash Booze and Spirits Podcast. <laughs> we're not getting any more social media ever because we're not good at this. Although, A Space is out now. The A Space? Is that what it is? The new MySpace plug? I don't know. There's a new MySpace is back. And it's in, made by a German teenager. So <laughs> Nick's doubly excited. I don't know. Double, double. <laughs> double, double. Duvender kid. All right. So uh, I guess all that's left to say is please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. And we will see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Crack. Crack is what you smoke, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good talk. Okay.